I'm going to begin uh, section 5.4 in this video, and uh, we're just going to talk more about integration here. Um, so uh, uh, an indefinite integral is an integral with no bounds, and uh, we've already uh, very briefly introduced integral notation in, um, in uh, section 4.9. Um, and uh, remember that when you find the general antiderivative, you always have to ha add a constant at the very end. Now, a definite integral just simply means that there's bounds, okay? And, um, and uh, many times when we compute a definite integral, we're calculating an area, okay? But the definite integral will always be a number. And uh, we take the antiderivative of the, lower, of the upper bound minus the antiderivative of the lower bound, okay? Um, notice how we don't have any plus C here with a definite integral because the constants will cancel. We just simply go to the... To the uh, um, to the number, whatever it is, um, when we plug in our uh, a and b values in the antiderivative. Okay, and uh, uh, okay, uh, a definite integral is a number I mentioned, whereas an indefinite integral is a function or a family of functions. Okay, um, let's take a look at some more examples. Uh, we'll start with some indefinite integrals. Okay, suppose that we want to integrate 5x squared plus secant squared x. Uh, well, the antiderivative of uh, 5x squared would be 5x cubed divided by 3. I'm using the reverse power rule. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. And then I know the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x, right? Uh, plus a constant, okay? Make sure that you remember your plus c. Uh, if you don't remember the plus c, I will take a point off because um, you're, in a way, you're indicating then that c is zero, but c can be any constant, right? And the derivative of a constant is always zero. Uh, if I want to check this, uh, I take a derivative, and I should get the integrand, okay? So the derivative of 5 thirds x cubed would be 5x squared. Derivative of tan x is secant squared x. Derivative of a constant is always zero. You don't need to check your answers, but I've mentioned already, you know, that a nice thing about antiderivatives is that you'll always know if you get the right answer. Take a derivative and see if you get back to the integrand that you uh, were originally given there. Okay, here's another one. Suppose that we want to integrate the function x to the negative second plus x to the negative first plus 1. Um, well, reverse power rule. So it's going to be x to the negative 1 divided by negative 1 plus, okay, um, I know I can't divide by zero, but careful about this, x to the negative one is just one over x, right? The antiderivative of one over x would be the ln of the absolute value of x, and uh, antiderivative of one is x, okay? Uh, be sure to uh, include the plus c. Now, um, negative x to the negative one, that'd be the same as negative one over x, uh, my answer is circled here. Now you'll notice that I've got absolute value bars inside the, uh, uh, the ln function there. That has to happen, okay? Um, be sure that you include those. If you don't have absolute value bars, it's actually a wrong answer, okay? Because uh, um, we know we can't take log of a negative. We know we can't take log of zero, but it's understood that x can't be zero to begin with since uh, we know we can't divide by zero. Uh, also, again, make sure that you're adding the constant. Now, if on occasion there's going to be some times where you'll calculate an antiderivative and then there might be some simplifying, you know, some more work afterwards, be sure that you include the plus C in, you know, each step, okay? Because I'll have students, uh, you know, find an antiderivative, but they will forget to write the constant, they'll do some simplifying, some work, and then all of a sudden here's a plus C at the end when they've got their answered circle. Don't do that, okay? Because uh, in a way, you're still saying that the constant is zero, okay? If, you, if you're using an equal sign, uh, C is not zero, right? C, uh, C can be any number, so we need to make sure that we have plus C at each line if there is additional work going on there. Uh, here's another example. Let's uh, integrate V times the quantity V squared plus 2 squared dV. Uh, well, I would want to first simplify the integrand. Okay, I'm going to FOIL out v squared plus 2 times v squared plus 2. That would be v to the fourth plus 4z squared plus 4. And then when you distribute v into those three terms, you have v to the fifth plus 4z, 4v cubed plus 4v. 
And now we're ready to go to the antiderivative. The antiderivative of v to the fifth is uh, v to the sixth over six, uh, plus the antiderivative of the next term would be four v to the fourth over four, the fours cancel there. I'm gonna leave you with v to the fourth, plus the antiderivative of four uh, v would be four z, four uh, v squared over two, four over two is two, and then plus c at the end. Okay, here's another one. Um, again, I'll want to simplify first. In this one, let's distribute secant t into these two terms. And I've done that. Okay, and now I'm ready to go to the antiderivative. Uh, antiderivative of secant squared t is tangent t. Antiderivative of secant t tangent t is secant t, since the derivative of secant t is secant t tangent t. And then plus c at the end. Okay, now on some of these you can go right to the answer. On some of them there's going to be some, you know, uh, algebra needed uh, before you take the antiderivative. Uh, here's one where we can go right to the answer. Okay, uh, antiderivative of uh, x cubed would be x to the fourth over four. One half times one fourth is one eighth. It'd be one eighth x to the fourth, and then plus eight is a constant that can come out of the antiderivative. Um, antiderivative of one over x squared plus one is tangent inverse of x, or arctan x, same thing, uh, plus a constant at the end. Now, obviously, I've already said this, obviously we have to know our derivatives, okay? Um, and uh, so it's a, you know, uh, it doesn't completely go away. Um, if you're still rusty with derivatives, it's a good idea to continue to practice um, and make sure that you're, you're, you're okay with that topic here. Um, let's try, uh, here's another example. Okay, if I want to integrate um, 3x minus 2 divided by the square root of x, I'm integrating from 1 to 9. The first thing that I'd recognize here is that this is a definite integral, so my answer is going to be just a single number rather than just a general expression. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, split this fraction into two fractions and then simplify each of the terms. 3x divided by root x would be 3 times root x, or 3 times x to the 1 half. Minus 2 over the square root of x, that'd be the same as minus 2x to the negative 1 half. And of course, I'd want to use fractional exponents since I want to use the reverse power rule here on the next line. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. So antiderivative of x to the 1 half, that'd be x to the 3 halves. Uh, divided by 3 halves is the same as uh, multiplying by two-thirds, and the threes would cancel there. Okay, minus two times x to the one-half divided by one-half. If you're dividing by one-half, that's the same as multiplying by two. Uh, you're evaluating this from one to nine. Make sure that you got the evaluation bar, and again, make sure that you're not writing the plus c. We only write plus c if we have an indefinite integral, okay, not a definite integral. Um, the threes cancel, like I said, and uh, now I'm ready to plug in my bounds. So uh, nine to the three half, well, nine to the one half is three. Three cubed is 27 times two is 54. And then minus nine to the one half is three times four is 12. Okay, minus the quantity when I plug in one, two minus four would be negative two. 54 minus 12, plus 2 is 44. And um, by the way, uh, if I were to draw the graph of this curve, I'm not going to do that, but if I were to look at the graph on the interval 1 to 9, the curve would be completely above the x-axis on the interval. Uh, so this answer here represents the area under the curve above the x-axis in between 1 and 9. Uh, here's another one. Okay, let's uh, integrate uh, uh, going from 0 to pi over 3, the function sine theta plus sine theta tangent squared theta all over secant squared theta d theta. Um, well, let's see. I think I have uh, uh, sine theta is in common to these two terms. I can go ahead and factor that out. And uh, that's going to leave me with 1 plus tangent squared theta. Now, I know secant squared theta minus tangent squared theta is 1. That's one of my Pythagorean identities. 
So secant squared theta would be the same as 1 plus tangent squared theta. I'm using that identity, and I can then cancel the secant squared theta terms. Uh, so this conveniently just simplifies to be sine theta. Antiderivative of sine theta is negative cosine theta. We're evaluating this from 0 to pi over 3. Uh, plug in the bounds. Cosine pi over 3 is 1 half. I've got a negative in front of that, though. And then minus uh, a negative means I'll be adding. Cosine of 0 is 1. Negative 1 half plus 1 is 1 half is the answer. Okay, and uh, here's another one. The integral going from negative 10 to 10 of 2e to the x divided by hyperbolic sine x plus hyperbolic cosine x. Well, I guess the first thing I'd want to do is rewrite these hyperbolic functions in terms of how they're defined uh, with e to the x and e to the negative x. And so I've done that. Um, I can also, uh, uh, let's see here, if I get a single fraction in the denominator, then negative e to the negative x plus e to the negative x, those would be gone. Um, 1 half e to the x plus 1 half e to the x would be e to the x. The e to the x's are going to cancel, and so this conveniently simplifies to be just 2 for the integrand. Antiderivative of 2 is 2x. Two uh, we're evaluating this from negative 10 to 10. Plug in the bounds. Uh, 2 times 10 is 20, minus 2 times negative 10 is negative 20, and you get 40 then is the answer with that. Okay, here's another one. Um, the integral going from 1 to 2 of y minus 1 cubed over y squared. Well, uh, let's see, so if I, um, if I expand the numerator, then here's what I get. And I'm going to go ahead and split this into uh, four individual terms on the next line. And I think I can then go to the antiderivative here. So the antiderivative of y would be y squared over 2 minus, it's going to be 3y for the next term, plus 3 times the ln of the absolute value of y minus, okay, this is the same as... Uh, y to the negative second, so you can apply the reverse power rule. Um, you're going to have y to the negative first divided by negative 1. You're subtracting a negative, so that means you're adding y to the negative first, which is the same as adding 1 over y. Uh, plug in the bounds now. When I plug in 2, uh, 2 squared is 4, half of 4 is 2, and then minus 6 plus 3 ln 2 plus 1 half, and then minus the quantity when I plug in 1, it's going to be 1 half minus 3 plus uh, ln 1 is 0, and then plus 1. Uh, combining your like terms there, you're going to have 3 ln 2 minus 2, which would be roughly 0 0.07944. Um, you don't need to, you know, exact answers. I've, I've stated that many times here. Uh, okay. Here's uh, another one. So how about the integral going from 1 half to 1 over root 2 of uh, 4 divided by the square root of 1 minus x squared. By the way, 1 over root 2 is bigger than 1 half. 1 over root 2 is roughly about 0 0.707 if you were to check that. Uh, so my bounds do make sense. The, you know, the lower bound smaller number, upper bounds bigger number. 4 is a constant. And a derivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared, that'd be sine inverse of x. And um, uh, now you can plug in, my, in your bounds there. Uh, okay, I've done that. Of course, I'd want to simplify. Sine inverse of 1 over root 2 would be pi over 4, since sine of pi over 4 gives you 1 over root 2. Sine inverse of 1 half would be pi over 6, since sine of pi over 6 would give you 1 half. Um, pi minus 2 thirds pi would be pi over 3. Okay, what's wrong with the calculation? Um, well, I know the antiderivative of secant squared x is tan x. Tangent of pi is 0. Tan, uh, tangent of 0 is 0, so you get 0. Okay, well, no, that's not correct because um, uh, secant x 
is not continuous on the interval of zero to pi. Uh, there's a vertical asymptote at pi over two. How I know that is because uh, you know secant x is defined as one over cosine x, and cosine pi over two is zero. I know I can't divide by zero. Be careful about this, okay? Um, don't just blindly calculate uh, assuming that you know you're continuous on the entire interval okay now likely you know nearly all the problems are going to be where you can do that but you, you got to be careful you don't want them to get you okay so double check and make sure that the function actually is continuous on the interval before you do the calculation um, I just had the uh, maybe three problems here in the book that I wanted to look at to just kind of wrap up uh, this section on page 409 um, problem 50 was uh, one problem that I liked. Uh, so here's problem 50. The bounds of a shaded region are the y-axis, the line y equal 1, and the curve y equal to 4 root of x. Find the area of this region by writing x as a function of y and then integrating with respect to y. Uh, all right, so y is the 4 root of x. If I take the fourth power of both sides, then um, x would be equal to y to the fourth. So if I set up a, an integral to find the area in terms of uh, y, uh, everything about my integral has to be in terms of y. Okay, so x is y to the fourth, that'd be my integrand. The conditions on y are that y is going from zero to one. Now x is also going from zero to one, but that's, I'm looking at the conditions on y here in order to set up my bounds. Um, reverse power rule y to the fifth over five would be the ni derivative. When you plug in one, you get one fifth. When you plug in zero, you get zero. One fifth is the answer. Okay. Um, problem 54 is uh, another one that I had marked. A honeybee population starts with 100 bees and increases at a rate of n prime of t bees per week. What does 100 plus the integral going from 0 to 15 of n prime of t dt represent? Okay, well, um, if we were to calculate the integral going from 0 to 15 of n prime of t dt, n would be the antiderivative. And uh, I'd plug in uh, 15 into the antiderivative and then plug 0 into the antiderivative. Now, n of 0, n is the number of b's in the population, t is the time. Uh, we were told that um, there is... Uh, uh, the population starts with 100 bees, they said right at the, at the beginning, so n of 0 would be 100, okay? And um, n of 15 would be the bee population at 15, okay? Uh, so with this uh, equation here, if I add 50, uh, 100 to both sides, then n of 15 is uh, what they were asking, okay, what does this expression represent? Uh, right here. Well, that's n of 15, okay, and so that would be the uh, uh, total B population after 15 weeks. Um, problem 64 is, uh, we'll look at that one. That's the uh, last one. Water flows from the bottom of a storage tank at a rate of R of t equals 200 minus 4t liters per minute, where t is between 0 and 50. Find the amount of water that flows from the tank during the first 10 minutes. Now, key word in this is rate, rate. Okay, R of T is a rate. So, um, if I integrate R of T, I will uh, have, have the antiderivative, okay? Um, of course, if I differentiate a function, I get a rate of change. And so, um, integrating uh, the rate from zero to 10, in order to find uh, um, uh, how much water flows in the first 10 minutes. And they were giving me R of t, so I can uh, get the antiderivative then. It'd be 200t minus 4t squared over 2. 4 over 2 is 2. Uh, I can plug in the bounds then. Okay, you got 2,000 minus 10 squared is 100 times 2 is 200. Plug in 0, you get 0 on these two terms. Uh, 1,800 liters is what we end up getting is the total amount of water that flows from the tank in the first 10 minutes. Okay. Um, that's all I have in this section, so hopefully that's enough. Um, 
The homework is on page 408. Uh, be sure to look at the odd number problems here uh, when you get a chance.